Welcome to the third and last of three video episodes sponsored by Hanyang University Erika's EAO program. This episode will discuss topics in advanced academic writing. Most of you know me by now, but for anyone unlucky enough to have only seen this video, my name is Dr. Kenneth Eckert. I'm Associate Professor of English Literature here at Hanyang Erika. And you can see here on the screen the textbook that I've written for academic writing and which I'm using to help structure this video series. And in this episode, we're going to talk about more advanced topics. And you have to have some mercy on me because you are coming to this video series from different skill sets and levels of expertise. Some of you needed the more low level topics and that's fine. Some of you have maybe been impatient waiting for me to get to the good stuff. Hopefully this episode is the good stuff. I'm going to first talk about editing, but then move on to dissertation committees, dissertation workflows, defenses, and then uh, possible writing scenarios after graduation, such as monographs and conference papers. So let's start with editing. And why here? I didn't really know a better place to put this, but I mentioned in the first episode that editing is the secret sauce of writing, the neglected skill that will rapidly increase the quality of your writing. Why am I telling you about this? Because this is one of my frustrations teaching in Korea is the cultural uh, focus on hard work. And sometimes hard work is not efficient. And cultures such as the Germans, they don't value hard work. They would look down on someone who simply brags how hard they work. Efficient work is the goal. And I'm discussing this because I do have students who say, well, I spent all night, all night long writing my paper and editing it. I deserve a break for doing that. That's not the most efficient way of writing. And I emphasized this in the first episode. It's not a good idea to write and edit on the same day. You may spend more time, but you're going to have a, a lower, you're likely going to have a lower quality result out of it. I find I have to sleep between writing and reading. And to use a computer hard drive analogy, I don't switch between write mode and read mode very quickly. So let's talk about two levels of editing. And one is fairly obvious, fixing mistakes. And Again, if you return to your work after resting and you look at it with fresh eyes, you're going to see errors. You're going to see mistakes such as grammar errors, missequenced paragraphs, or missing or duplicated information. And that's fine. That, that's a valid part of editing, and it's necessary. But we want more than that, right? We want to move into the master class of editing, which is making it better. And I think a good catchphrase for that is less is more. If you can convey ideas and information equally or more clearly in fewer words, that's efficient editing. And I know I make fun of my undergraduates a lot. I don't mean to. They're, they're learning, they're younger, they're making mistakes just like I did. And if I use my undergraduates as a negative example, I hope you're taking it in good humor. But my undergraduates would never think this way because to them, the goal is to make more writing, to make more text, to get up to a word count. The last thing they're worried about is removing words. But I'm telling you that once you get into professional life and, and postgraduate writing, you're going to be thinking in terms of fitting your words into limits. And to do that, you need to learn how to remove excess words and phrases and paragraphs. So let's get to pro-level editing. And our goal is to cut redundant text that is redundant. Hopefully you're seeing my joke here. These last few words don't add anything. They can be removed. And that's the skill you're trying to develop in editing, is moving through your paper and looking for excess words that add nothing. And this is one reason why academia generally discourages using I in your paper. More on that in a few minutes. It's because I is often redundant. We know it's you that believes X equals Y. Your cat didn't write the paper. 
you could just write x equals y and it would be the same meaning. Sometimes I have students who have dictionary definitions in their paper, and there's a place for it. If the terminology is obscure, it might be helpful, but beginning your paper with a definition of abortion is silly. The reader knows what abortion is, and having that dictionary definition there is at best pretentious and at worst waste space. Another trick from composition theorist William Zinser is to remove unnecessary modifiers. Somewhat, rather, quite, very. These are often words you don't need, or you can just replace them with better adjectives. Professor Eckert's video is very boring. Okay, Professor Eckert's video is stupefying, deadening. And a pet peeve I have to mention here is writers who sprinkle in etc. all through their papers. Often that etc. is obvious when you discuss a list. The reader knows quite well it's not an exhaustive or complete list, that you're simply listing examples. Returning back to that infamous I, perhaps you've been told never put I in an academic paper because the essay police will knock on your door and arrest you. In truth, academic disciplines and cultures vary in their acceptance of I in papers. Sometimes I do see them in technical or scientific papers, although more typically it would be we because such papers are often group written, but I find that I is more common in European papers, less so in the United States. I've had papers where I sent the paper to an American journal and the editor asked me to take out all of the I's. That might not happen with a British submission. I'm going to approach it as an editing issue, that often I's are redundant, they're obvious. We know it's you who thinks so. And so I think a good reason to minimize the use of I is simple word economy. There is a place I think occasionally for I, such as a personal reference. Remember when I spoke about pathos in the previous lecture, if you were writing about a, a social issue that touched you personally, you might, you might have a brief anecdote, and that could be appropriate. But my advice is don't overdo it. I average about one I in a paper. After that, there's a temptation to make the paper about yourself and to forget about the topic. Another editing practice you might cultivate is to raise your academic tone. And by that, I mean scanning through your paper looking for places where you might use a more precise or scholarly phrasing. The example here, overpopulation, is a big problem. I always find the word big a bit slangy. It's also not very precise. A serious, critical, dangerous, worsening, treatening, whatever problem, that adds more definition and clarity to your sentence. It also looks better. Other words that are commonly overused good, nice, bad, instead of those words, effective, advantageous, deleterious, whatever, again, they raise the credibility and ethos of your writing. Don't overdo it. Uh, I'm not encouraging you to use the longest word for its own sake. That may confuse the reader, and it may be at cross purposes. That does not make your writing more clear if people don't understand what you're saying. Imagine Martin Luther King saying this, I have custody of a personal aspiration, half of the audience would be confused, and it would certainly not have the rhetorical bite of, I have a dream. I'd also like to credit my old professor Stephen Brown at UNLV for another way of raising academic tone in your paper while maximizing word economy. Remember when I spoke about quotations and I said the signal phrases that begin with according to can get pretty repetitive. Rather than using says or according to, here are some other words, other verbs that might be just as effective or add variety. But notice also that some of these verbs add a nuance to how you are approaching or how you are evaluating the quotation. For example, if you want to indicate that you agree with the quotation you're about to give, you might use finds, concludes, states. If you want to be more neutral, notes, observes, indicates. If you want to give the nuance that 
the source you're indicating is only giving a suggestion or an idea. You might say your source posits, theorizes ventures, or if you want to telegraph to your reader that you are indicating a quotation that you don't agree with, you might say contends, maintains, insists. And doing these things may help you to eliminate a sentence after the quotation where you interpret or relate to it. Sexist writing. A few years ago, I read a composition book which I felt was overly politically correct. All of the pronouns in the book were she, and I felt left out of the discussion after a while. But many women have this experience when academic text persistently only uses he and him pronouns. This has become a concern in the English language in the last decade or so. How to avoid repeti repetitively using male pronouns. And I'm not going to get into the ethics and the social issues of this. I'm going to approach it as an editing issue that often these he's and him's, they aren't necessary. So rather than an engineer must see his ethical responsibilities, pluralize, engineers must see their ethical responsibilities or rephrase. There is this false idea that you are never supposed to use passives in academic writing. That's not true. They have a place and this is a place. Ethical responsibilities must be seen by engineers. Engineering ethics must be recognized. Fewer words, clearer meaning, no pronoun reference. It's a win all around. Peer editing is the last thing I'm going to discuss in this section on editing, and that's group review, where you gather a group of friends or colleagues, and either in person or electronically through email, you look at each other's work and you make constructive suggestions to improve it. I find that peer editing is pretty binary. It works very well or it works very poorly. And it works the best when members trust each other and they feel comfortable giving uh, constructive criticism to each other. When people are not comfortable with each other, they tend to make very safe comments, often simply grammar corrections. You may be thinking that it's best to bring a complete paper to the peer edit. My experience is that this is not true, that when this happens, writers can feel defensive or protective about hearing any proposed changes or edits. It's often more productive to bring an essay that's late in the writing stage, but not completed. Up until now, I've spoken more broadly about the seminar papers you might be writing as a graduate or honors undergraduate student. The next two sections will focus more specifically on the writing of theses and dissertations. I'm going to begin by laying out the common sections of a social sciences or hard sciences dissertation, because I realize most of you are in these disciplines who are watching, and it's pretty intimidating. We've left the five paragraph model far behind. I realize not all of you are going to have all of these sections in your paper, it's going to vary depending on your own needs and perhaps on the culture of your own discipline or the rules of your department, but this is typical. Let's break it down so that it's less intimidating. Typically, such a paper will begin with a title page, table of contents, abstract. I'll talk about these sections more momentarily. The introduction might also have its own subsections of identifying a problem, indicating the paper's purposes, how it will answer this need, a background information section, which might have some basic terminology, a literature review, a methodology section, and we're up to eight, but the bulk of your paper is going to be your results and discussion section, followed off by conclusions, acknowledgements, references, tables, and so on. As you can see, an MLA thesis or dissertation would likely have a more simplified structure. I know I told you earlier MLA does not have title pages in seminar papers. You probably would at a thesis or dissertation level, followed by a table of contents, abstract, introduction, and then you can see the sections after then are slightly simplified, and you may have explicit headings for these sections, or maybe not, the text might just flow freely. 
More on section headings. You can see in APA and MLA, there are standard typographical formats for indicating top or first level headings, major sections and titles, and then second level, third level headings, and so on. And again, the culture of APA and IEEE is to use more headings. At least the title, abstract, and reference are marked. MLA uses fewer explicit headings. I find fewer is better because too many waste space at an editing level, and often it feels jarring to have the paper continually stopping and starting. But I accept APA uses more of them. One thing I've noticed with MLA, with APA is, is that they now discourage writers from explicitly marking their introduction sections. I suppose they feel it's obvious. Although writers seem to insist on having them anyway. Abstracts. An abstract is a brief summary of your paper's arguments and findings. Typically, they're 100 to 250 words, often in one block paragraph with five or seven keywords. Usually, no citations. And a point I want to stress with abstracts is that they are not a part of your paper. They are outside your paper looking at it. And some people are only going to read your abstract, and then they're going to make a decision whether to look up your paper or not, or whether to continue reading. And if someone only has access to your abstract, they don't know where your citations are coming from. More things you should not do in an abstract. Abstracts do not replace the paper's introduction. Do not assume that if you've indicated your basic arguments and claims in your abstract, you don't need to do it in your introduction, because your abstract is not part of your paper. It comes before. And for some people reading your article or dissertation, it may be printed after the paper. Second, abstracts are not a movie teaser for your paper. They should briefly summarize your paper's claims and its results or conclusions. Another error I see occasionally in abstracts is ones that are simply lists of the topics in the paper that indicate this paper has an introduction, discussion, and conclusion about these things. That's pretty obvious, but it doesn't give us substantive information about what the paper will discuss. Abstract do's. Remember when I spoke about conclusions when we discussed the five paragraph essay model. And I indicated that a good way of looking at writing is to remember it's a time-based act for the reader. At the beginning of the paper, the reader does not know the end of the paper the way you do. And instead of seeing the abstract as starting the paper, once again, see it as outside the paper, looking at the paper as a whole. Tables of contents. If your department says you need one, you need one. And in a thesis or dissertation, it may be helpful for the reader to know where major chapters or section divisions are. Otherwise, a TOC is a judgment call. In a short seminar paper, it might be a waste of space. And it's pretty silly to have a table of contents in a five-page paper. I won't speak more, much more about this, except to highly recommend that you learn how your word processor makes tables of contents. If you try to make your own, the periods are never going to line up. It would be better to learn to use the auto-generating function. Let's discuss literature reviews in more detail. A lit review answers the question, what sources do I need to read in order to understand this paper's subject? A lit review could be an entire freestanding paper, but normally it's a short section after your introduction. Sometimes I've had student papers where the literature review got out of hand and it started to dominate the essay, but I find about 10 to 15% of your paper is a good parameter. I also think a good literature review has a sort of organizational logic or rationale to its sequencing. So rather than listing your sources randomly, you might find some sort of uh, reason to group your sources. You could go chronologically, where you list old sources moving to new sources. 
You could categorize your sources by major schools of thought, or you could even have sources that disagree with you, then ones that do agree with you, or you could move from general works on the subject, moving towards ones that are specifically relevant to your paper's argument. Methodology sections. This sort of section is pretty typical in social science and science papers, less so in humanities. In a humanities paper, you might simply have a sentence or two rather than an explicitly marked section. A methodology section indicates the type of argumentation or evidence that will be primarily used, such as qualitative, based on abstract reasoning, or quantitative, more statistical or empirical. This overlaps with the ideas that I expressed earlier of logos, pathos, ethos, though they're not quite the same thing. You can see an example here. As with an abstract or lit review, keep it brief, don't let this section spin out of control, get to your body section. By one third into your paper, you should be there. And now we get to the body section of your paper, but it would be pretty silly to call your body section the body section in a heading, so it's often called the discussion section or something else. In MLA, it probably wouldn't be marked at all. You would just get into it. So I won't speak much more about this because it's pretty self-evident. I'd like to speak briefly about acknowledgements because no one else seems to. There aren't really rules for them, but there are conventions. Usually they go at the beginning of a dissertation, but at the end of a published paper before the references. For some reason, they're typically phrased in third person. The authors would like to thank blah, blah, blah. Other than that, not even the people at APA are going to tell you who you should thank and who you should love. That's your decision. I do find that if you are writing acknowledgements in a dissertation, you have all the space you like and you can thank God or thank your spouse or thank your mailman or thank your goldfish, and that's fine. If you are writing acknowledgements at the end of an academic journal article, as a rule, keep it short. Space is at a premium. Thank a few people. Be done. In the previous section, I discussed more specifically the nuts and bolts of the thesis or dissertation structure. I'm now going to move more broadly into the overall workflow of organizing a committee, writing the paper, and then defending it. I've used these two terms pretty much interchangeably throughout these videos, thesis and dissertation. I don't mean a thesis statement, but thesis as the document. And that's because different countries and cultures use their own terminology. In my native Canada, a master's student writes a thesis, a doctoral student writes a dissertation. In some countries, it's the opposite. For simplicity's sake, from here on, I'm going to use the word dissertation to mean both types of documents. In organizing a committee, which is a first or early step, you may or may not get a say in who your advisor and committee members are. And if that's the case, fine. And if it's not the case and you have the liberty of choosing your own members, a typical committee is going to be your advisor and usually three or so professors, often one outside your department on the belief that that professor will be more objective. This is going to sound personal or maybe too touchy-feely, but I'm telling you this from my own experience and from that of friends and colleagues. If you have a choice, choose people you like as opposed to the best people or the ones closest to your discipline. It's a little bit like a marriage. You're going to be interacting with these people a great deal over months or even years, and it's going to multiply your stress level if you don't get along with your advisor or committee members. If you have a dictator or a slacker who doesn't do anything, that is much worse than having someone who is a little outside your subject field, but who is still enthusiastic and supportive of you. The dissertation proposal, if you aren't required to write one, no problem. If you do, don't stress it. 
If you've already discussed what you're going to do with your advisor and you have approval, this usually shouldn't take long. And you can see the framework of the one I wrote for my own master's, which was about 1,700 words. It was a proposed name of the thesis, some search terms, and a, a, bit of, a bit of description of the categories that I was writing within, thesis chapters, summaries of each chapter, and then a working bibliography. It's taken for granted that your final dissertation may not exactly match your proposal. I don't know of any committee that will be so mean that they're going to reject your dissertation because it doesn't exactly match. They likely had the same experience. I did write my own dissertation, but now that I'm a professor and I've supervised other graduate candidates, maybe I can see the process from a bit more objective distance. Probably the most common problem I see in dissertation proposals is that they're too greedy. The proposal's topic is too ambitious and too broad. And as a result, the candidate can't finish it and burns out. And I've seen this happen with very bright students who just bit off more than they could chew. Alternatively, I've, I've had candidates who were not geniuses, but they had the properly sized topic and they had the diligence and persistence to see it through. Avoiding burnout is a real danger. And I think one way of minimizing that risk is not to see your dissertation as a magnum opus of 27 volumes bound in leather. It is not the best thing you're ever going to do or what you're going to be judged on the rest of your life. It is proof you can do scholarly work, not the scholarly work itself. Trying to make your dissertation a flawless masterpiece is going to exhaust you. And again, I've had candidates who were satisfied with good enough, and they are the ones who finish. Graduate candidates write a dissertation partly for the content, for the product of the paper itself, but also to learn a skill set, and I think more specifically, a cognitive and an emotional discipline. And I think one way of making this project less scary, as I mentioned when I discussed outlines, is that you might break this project into smaller papers, which you can combine and smooth over later on. And you might do what I did in my own dissertation, which is to frame each chapter as a future journal article in length, subject, and style. I'll speak about that more in a moment. Something else I've seen graduate candidates do, and I'm warning you from falling into that trap, is righteous procrastination. By that, I mean doing something you don't like in order to avoid something you don't like even more and fooling yourself into thinking that you've sacrificed. Or to be more concrete, I've seen candidates who read and read and read and believe they're being diligent students, but it's really a way of putting off doing the writing. I did that a little bit when I was writing my master's, and you can spend the rest of your life reading if you choose to, and what you might need to do is write a date on a calendar when you're mainly going to stop reading and you're going to start writing. Another emotional skill is keeping the lines of communication open. I've had candidates simply disappear because they're embarrassed or they're afraid I'm going to yell at them. Don't ignore your committee's or advisor's messages because you haven't done your work. You're going to frustrate them and make things worse. It would be much better to admit you're behind than to hide. When you have finished your dissertation, in some departments, you just submit it, the end, that's very nice. More commonly, you will defend it in front of your committee and perhaps even an invited audience. And the style and structure of defenses varies. In Europe, the defense might be more formal. There might be outfits and ceremonial swords. In the United States, the defense might be more informal or even online. If there's one commonality to defenses, it's that the candidate is always terrified, and typically people view it as an extremely stressful experience. If there's another commonality, it's that the typical candidate afterwards says, well, it really wasn't so bad and I was scared for nothing. 
that was my situation. And I think if you've written a good thesis or dissertation and your advisor is happy with it, the defense is likely perfunctory. The committee is not your enemies. They want you to succeed. I have seen some horror stories. A few years ago, well, quite a few years ago, I had I, I was on a committee where a girl antagonized her advisor and committee. She wanted to defend when the advisor said she was not ready. She gave the committee her thesis the day before the defense, a very bad thing to do. And to make things worse, she plagiarized and she was failed on the spot during her defense. On the positive side, so that I don't make all of you even more afraid, I did have I did have a graduate professor who had an American colleague, and this man was invited out to a bar the night before the defense, and they drank too much beer, and the next morning the man was terrified because he was hung over and about to do his dissertation defense, and the committee shook his hand and said, congratulations, we really had our defense the night before, and we just didn't want to make you nervous. So again, Defenses vary. Better defenses, how to optimize your defense, or at least what can I tell you from my own experience? My own experience is that a PowerPoint may be optional. You may not have to have one. And I know Koreans love PowerPoint. Some of you, if you had a choice, you would marry a PowerPoint. But the most enjoyable defenses I've sat in on were ones where the candidate just talk to us, and there was a real intimacy to that. If you do have a PowerPoint, remember when I spoke about chunking. Do the same when you're designing a table of contents at the beginning. Have only a few major topics so that the audience doesn't forget them. Overall, people overdo their thesis defenses. It's best to keep your defense simple and short so that the committee isn't overwhelmed or bored. No thesis committee has ever said that was a good defense, but I wish it was longer. One last tip, don't bother with a paper handout of your slides. Some candidates seem to insist on making them. Everybody throws them away anyway. Control body language. I've already stated this, but part of the reason you complete a dissertation is the product, the paper, but it's also developing a skill set. And one of those skills is Confidence is demonstrating to, to the committee that you can defend and explain your ideas in a professional collegial manner. You are the expert. You are not a student. You are a professor or fellow academic in training, and you know more about the subject of your thesis than anyone else there probably does. You've done the research and the writing of it. And if you know the word commencement, the ceremony you might have during graduation, that semantically or etymologically does not mean the beginning of something. It refers to the Latin word for eating, comer. And the idea was in a medieval commencement that you have a meal with your professors as a sort of indication that you are now equals and you are peers among them. For that reason, Learn to control your body language to project that sort of confidence and competence. You want to avoid mumbling or fidgeting or hiding behind the podium, all things which will reduce the confidence that the committee has in what you're saying. Handling aggressive questions. I did have a colleague at a former university who was an ex-lawyer, and he would ask quite hostile questions to the candidates. Why did you write this? And uh, the idea was to see if the candidate could think and explain things under pressure. And so the hostility was an act. And again, as I've just mentioned in the previous slide, much of the reason you have a defense is to show you can demonstrate confidence and competence in, in defending your ideas. If you don't know an answer, it happens. Ask for more explanation about the question or admit you don't know. And saying you don't know in a confident way is much better than fudging or trying to lie. Thesis grading. Of course, mileage may vary. Your department may have different regulations. 
But this is typical, and this is what I had myself when I was a candidate. Often the committee will evaluate your thesis and then and your defense, and then either give you a full pass and you're done, celebrate, or you may pass with minor corrections where you need to make some small changes, but a new defense is probably not required. You're in more serious trouble if you are given a conditional pass, which means major improvements or changes are required, and then likely a new defense. Your, uh, the worst case scenario is a fail, where the thesis is rejected, and you may need to begin again. When you graduate, when it's all done, good for you, party time. Some people compare completing a thesis or dissertation to giving birth. I don't think that's exactly true though, because people want to see your new baby and they'll say the baby is cute. Not many people will ever read your dissertation again. And that's not to discourage you, but to keep you realistic in your expectations for writing your dissertation. The, the best dissertation is one that's done. The last section in this video and in this video series is on beyond the class paper. I know for some of you it's not relevant. You're preparing a thesis or dissertation and you're not thinking about writing beyond that point. But for those of you who are, who are preparing for that now, or who are anticipating a future where you need to write journal articles or other professional writing, such as edited chapters or conference papers, this may be of relevance or help for you. I'm going to begin by discussing journal publications, because in many fields, that is the most prestigious activity that's done among academics. And certainly at Hanyang University and Korean and Asian universities generally, that is the number one metric in promotion, hiring, and tenure decisions. What have you published and where? To define such a thing, a journal article is typically a research paper of 15 to 30 pages at a top level of subject knowledge. Paper lengths vary from discipline to discipline, but that's typical ranges. Journal articles and the journals they are printed in are usually disseminated by universities or academic foundations. They may be single authored or they may be multiple authored. The humanities uh, tends to have more single authored papers. STEM fields, often you can have lists of two, three, four, ten 10 authors on a single paper. A common question that a new graduate has is, can I take my thesis and use some of the material from it and publish it as journal articles? Yes, I think that's an excellent way to do something with your already completed research. Sometimes I've sat in defenses where I've thought, this is great, and it's a shame that this thesis is going to sit on a shelf. And it's much better if you do something useful with that material. However, few chapters are published unrevised. Usually there's extensive editing involved and typically deeper citation density, more sources in a journal article as well. A major hurdle you need to cross is that your committee might be satisfied with any topic that excites you and is doable. A journal may require a rationale for your paper. Why is it important to scholars? Why should this be printed? Why is this essential information for our readers? For that reason, published papers often have longer introduction sections where they justify why the research or findings of the paper are important. Typical journal workflows that you can anticipate is that the article is received by the journal. Sometimes if you're unlucky, you get a very prompt desk reject from the editor. If that doesn't happen, the article typically goes out to a set of reviewers, peers in the field who can judge and make a recommendation on your submission. From then on, there's a sort of hierarchy of results from good to bad. The best case scenario is that your article is accepted as is. That's pretty rare. That's never happened to me. The second scenario is your article is accepted with minor revisions. I have occasionally had this happen. That's about as good as it gets. 
What's more typical is that your article is accepted with major revisions or you are given a revise and resubmit, often called an R&R, &R, where the article is uh, where you get the direction of major revisions and then the submission will go back to the readers or different readers and it will be evaluated again. And those reviewers could reject or accept the paper uh, on those terms. The worst case scenario is that the article is rejected and you need to start over with a different journal. Journals typically belong to indexes. Remember I discussed this when we talked about evaluating sources. And just as you as a writer evaluate the credibility of an article from its journal index, the same applies when you write an article for a journal. The gold standard again is Thomson Reuters, which disseminates SCI, SSCI, and ANHCI indexes, meaning sci hard science, social science, and humanities cores. Failing that, very good indexes, National Research Foundation of Korea, Chimago Scopus Web of Science, and others of their ilk, if you can't get an article in those index journals, you might look at minor indexes or non-indexed journals, which is better than nothing. What I really advise you do avoid is predatory journals, which invite you in spam emails, typically with misspelled words and empty flattery. Here I think Groucho Marx's famous joke that he would never join a country club that would ask him to join. I think that applies to journals. Uh, I think a journal worth submitting to doesn't send you a spam email. Should you pay fees to publish? Well, having said that, I don't think you should rule out that option if you can afford to do it. There are exceptions. There are some perfectly legit Korean journals, for example, which are only open access meaning they are not, uh, the articles are not locked behind subscription walls. Anybody can view those articles. And for that reason, the journals do need some support funds. They may have smaller mandatory fees. And this could be a judgment call whether you're willing to pay those fees or not. Why not just send your article to the best journal? That will maximize the credibility of the article and it will look the best on your resume because the best journals also have, invariably, the highest rejection rates. When I was finishing my own doctorate, I had a course paper that I thought was pretty good. I sent it to the best journal in my field, and they very quickly rejected it with a rejection that I thought was not very kindly phrased, and that just discouraged me. That's the thing about academic journals. These people don't know you and they're not your friends and they have less motive to be nice to you. And some rejections that you receive from academic journals, they're not going to be kind. And there will be politics involved. And for that reason, you are going to need a great deal of persistence in writing for academic journals. Acceptance can sometimes come randomly the first time, sometimes it takes years, I've had articles that I thought were okay, which were accepted on the first submission. I've written work that I thought was very good that took five years and a dozen journals to get it accepted. And occasionally I've had articles that I just gave up on because no one was interested. And sometimes you just have to learn through experience when to make that, when to make that decision. More on revisions, not much seems to be said about this but I think how to effectively revise an article is important. What I mean by this is you may have an article conditionally accepted by a journal and the instructions from the reviewers are for certain changes to be made. It's human to be frustrated or angry when you receive these reports. Some of the people writing them are jerks. They may not be kindly phrased or tactful. What I recommend is that you leave these reports alone for a few days until you calm down. When you come back to work on your revisions, I think it's a good idea to build your confidence by doing the easy things first. Look at simple grammar formatting uh, changes you can make or work on 
again, low-level factual mistakes. From then on, one thing I do if I haven't read the article in several months and it's not fresh in my mind, is I reverse engineer an outline so that I can see the paragraphs or sections of the paper at a graphical level. One more thing I'd like to add here. When I spoke about defenses, I said confidence is important. I think it is also the case in revisions. You don't need to agree with everything that your reviewers recommend. Sometimes you can't because there's two reviewers who give you conflicting recommendations. Don't be afraid to tell your editor that you don't agree with one of the reviewers, and often the editor will respect your opinion, but you should be prepared to defend your choices. My own confession, I am a journal reviewer. Sometimes journals send me articles asking me to write recommendation reports. If I can help you with this, I will. Three main reasons, I usually recommend rejection of a paper. The two you can predict. One, the thesis is not clear. I don't know what you're trying to prove in the paper. Number two, the evidence is not persuasive or there isn't enough of it. Number three, the content is too vague. What do I mean by that? I have rejected papers which were so vague and abstract that I didn't know what they were talking about. About a year ago, I was asked to look at some graduate writing by a student, and the writing was at a very high level, but it was always at a high level, so much so that it became fatiguing. And again, in places, the, di the discussion was so abstract that I didn't know what the paper was talking about. Do write about difficult things, but occasionally dip back down to concrete facts and examples to help ground your discussion. And you might remember Eric Hayat's advice to build paragraph waves or upside down Vs where you alternate between easy and difficult quotations and discussions, whether you do this at a paragraph or a wider paper level. Moving on to conference presentations. In my own field of English literature, conferences are not as critical as academic journal articles and monographs, but in some faster moving fields, reading papers and having them published in collections, called proceedings, is more valuable than articles. I have a colleague who teaches computer science, and by the time he would get an article published in a print journal, the information is outdated. So the real action goes on at conferences. As well, reading papers and meeting other scholars is an excellent way to keep current in your field and to make contacts. It may also be an effective way of testing out a journal submission and getting advice before you submit it. I'm going to give you the same caveat that I gave you with journals, that at a conference, you're running with the big dogs. You're congregating with scholars and experts in your field. Not everyone will be nice. As with predatory journals, another reality of being an academic is that you're going to be targeted by bogus conferences. One of my colleagues went to one and read a paper to an empty room. Evidently, the purpose of the conference was to give the participants a golf holiday and give the organizers money. For this reason, many universities no longer weigh conferences in promotion and employment decisions because of this growing glut of fake ones. How can you recognize one? You have to trust your instincts. But like as with predatory journals, there are a few common red flags. One is that you are invited in a spam email. Another is that the subject is so broad that it will fit any academic discipline. Other typical signs that the conference may not be legit. One is that your colleagues have never heard of it. It's not a familiar annual event that they know of. My last point may be controversial because it doesn't always apply, but often the conference location is obscure or it's an obvious vacation spot. If you're preparing a conference paper, either from a pre-existing disc chapter or from new material, there's two common forms that these conference sessions take. The traditional form is reading a paper off a page. The advantage to that is that it's easier to plan. The disadvantage is that it's boring 
to see a professor stare at a sheet of paper. Increasingly, conference sessions are much like what I'm doing now, where a professor speaks to the audience and has PowerPoint slides or similar as a, as a visual aid. The advantage to this is that it's typically more visually interesting and interactive. The disadvantage is that it's more difficult to time and plan. If you're doing so, if you're adapting a seminar paper or a disc chapter or whatever to a conference, it's a good idea to have far fewer quotations because the audience doesn't know the difference. The audience doesn't always know whether you are speaking or an external source is speaking. As well, it's a good idea to have more signposting, more verbal explanations and markers of where you are in the sequence and structure of your paper. At a conference, typical session slots are half an hour with 20 minutes of presentation, 10 minutes of questions, or an hour with 40 minutes of presentation, 20 minutes of questions. When you're planning, a typical pace is a page of double-spaced text every two minutes. And you should practice and plan out the time of your presentation because something always goes wrong at a conference. There will be technical issues with your slides loading or someone will go over time in the presentation slot before yours. Anticipate this. One thing you might do is mark cues in your script for must-see slides or topics and nice-to-see ones in case you need to slip to skip some if you're running out of time. Throughout this video series, I've used the term monograph, and that's just a fancy word for book. Although some academic books are not monographs, mono, one author, single. Some academic books are not, are not written by one person. They're edited collections created from multiple writers. A monograph could be a revised thesis or dissertation. It could be a collection of previously published articles that are edited together. It could be an original work on a single topic, such as professors often do during a sabbatical year. If you are not writing a monograph, you could also submit a revised chapter from your dissertation to an edited volume. Submitting a book proposal is somewhat similar to submitting an academic journal article, although there's often much more paperwork involved. University or academic presses may have a standard submission form, or they may ask for a list of specifications. Occasionally, they may accept a simple email. Academic journals almost never permit simultaneous submissions, meaning you can't submit an article to a journal if it's still under consideration somewhere else. Book publishers usually let you do this, although it's good courtesy to tell them. Again, beware of predatory presses that charge fees but will do nothing to promote your book. It's difficult to get a book proposal accepted and the rejection rate is typically even much higher than it is for academic journals. If no one wants your book because it's not good enough, or it appeals to a, a special or small readership. As a last case scenario, which is better than nothing, you might consider self-publishing with Amazon or other fulfillers or publishers, such as I did with my writing textbook. Hopefully not because it's no good, but because again, it appeals to a smaller uh, readership that might buy the book. One advantage to self-publishing is you have complete creative control, and it's easier to modify the book whenever you need to. As a coda to this discussion, I'm going to emphasize again, you need enormous patience to publish a book. Remember my computer science colleague I mentioned. If he had written a book on Windows XP, people might be using Windows 10 by the time the book comes out, and the book would be useless. Unless you're a celebrity or an ex-president, publishing can be an extremely slow process. This is why non-traditional and digital writing is growing as an alternative, which I'm now going to speak briefly about. I realize most of you are not going to be professors, and even for those of you who are, you may be doing other forms of academic and professional writing 
besides the genres that we've discussed, including technical writing, which is instruction manuals, technical briefs, proposals, and so on, or business writing, including resumes, corporate releases, grant proposals, and similar. This is perhaps not the most exciting type of writing, but it's necessary, and some people do it as a career choice, and it can be quite well-paying. You may only need to do your own resume, and like technical writing, resumes and CVs, curriculum vitae, they emphasize brevity and clarity, because most employers don't read CVs for very long because they have so many of them. Like business writing, these texts are often shaped to maximize a positive impression. And like online writing, which we'll get to, these texts need to be visually attractive. And so there may be design concepts you need to think about when you're designing a resume or CV. You may need to think about fonts, graphics, and space. Web writing may also appeal to you, and I think it's a growing and important alternative outlet for academic discourse. Writing for internet sites and social media is going to require new skills such as knowledge of code, graphics, and multimedia. Another advantage of online writing is that it's much faster paced, and so the turnaround in schedules may be very fast in days or hours as opposed to print media, which might operate in months or years. If you are going to pursue online writing, it's going to also require a different attitude to how you see text, because articles and books are linear. They have a beginning, they have an end on the last page, whereas online text is often based in chunks or multiple streams of text in a non-hierarchical matrix, thus the web. I'd also like to mention and recommend Wikipedia as another online outlet for academic writing. And what Wikipedia does is they've crowdsourced their peer review so that anyone can write on any topic, anyone else can edit or revise that entry. So far, Wikipedia is not that popular in Asia, and that's a shame. I think it's one of the most important and valuable inventions of the 21st century. And it may not help you in a job interview or on your resume to say that you're a Wikipedia editor, but I do think it's good practice in expository neutral writing, that is academic writing that is not argument based. And as well, if I can preach for a moment, not everything in life must make you money. Wikipedia is one of the greatest philanthropic projects ever. It's also viewed by 263 million people a month, and your contribution to Wikipedia may reach an audience that would never have the education or ability to read or access academic articles. And this brings us to the end of this video episode and this series on academic writing. And I'm hoping that I've shown you that academic writing may not always be fun, but it can be rewarding and with some practice, it can be more efficient and optimally sometimes enjoyable. In the first episode, I stated that writing has some science and some art to it, meaning that even if you're writing a fairly dry technical paper, there are some rules, there are some conventions, but there's also scope for you to bring your own personality and your own style to that writing. And that's a good thing. I wouldn't want to make these videos and create photocopies of myself. That would make a boring world. I have three pairs of glasses. This one is for close reading of books. This one is for bright sunshine, but they all basically show me the same thing. This one doesn't show me a nightclub. This one doesn't show me the beach. They all show me a common set of facts or objects. They just have different emphases or focuses that they're showing me. And I hope you're seeing the analogy here that you, along with other academics, may be viewing a common set of facts or ideas, but you're, you're going to have your own 
sets of focus or priorities or interests when you describe them. And again, that's a good thing. There's going to be bad days when you're writing your dissertation, when you feel discouraged, when you tell yourself or when other people tell you, why are you wasting your time writing about something so small and trivial that no one will ever care about? I think that what you do is important and that what you do can make the world a better place. And in a very complicated world, getting a small thing correct is important. Because if you take that small piece of information and you put it together with what other scholars do, you end up with something beautiful and valuable. Again, thank you for watching, and this is the end. Take care.